I'm really happy to join you from right here in Des Moines, Iowa. I've seen so much great information coming out of your FutureCon events, and I've enjoyed attending them. You know, I know the amount of effort, planning, and time and leadership it takes to put them on, especially hybrid and online conferences. So congratulations and kudos to you and your team. And I do want to give a quick disclaimer uh, before I get started here. The views and opinions expressed today are mine and those of my privacy professor consultancy and also the privacy and security Brainiac SaaS business um, team. So I'm not speaking on behalf of any of my clients, nor should any of the information I provide be attributed to them unless I am expressly quoting them. So. With that out of the way, let's go on to the next slide here. Internet of Things, or IoT for short, devices, you know, they're becoming so ubiquitous. IoT things, smart things, smart watches, smart cars, smart refrigerators and coffee makers. There's an unlimited number, literally an unlimited number of other types of smart things. Now for my presentation today, I'm considering an IoT device as a device that has the ability to digitally interact with the environment <clears throat> in some way. So it might be collecting or deriving or sharing or processing or storing or any combination of those activities, different types of data such as images, audio, video, or some other type of data. And this is in addition to the primary function of that thing, right? Like a smart toothbrush, you know, they need to actually brush your teeth and clean them, not just collect data about your oral hygiene. Various research groups estimate that there are currently close to 20 billion business manufactured smart devices worldwide. And I have that caveat in there because anybody can create their own IoT device. It's not that hard. Estimates vary greatly, but there are expected to be anywhere from 70 billion to 200 billion. Yes, that varies greatly. Smart devices by 2026. And these are for the, the manufactured ones. Now, just consider that each of these devices interacts with and often are supported by computers, cloud services, apps, Wi-Fi routers, controllers, gateways, and hubs. Imagine that in your mind. It truly is rather mind-boggling that this means that IoT devices plus those components result in a very rough estimate of around 500 billion total computing devices currently within the IoT digital ecosystem. That's a lot of devices and data to secure. And you need to make sure that you know where all of those devices are, or at least have a good idea of it. So my focus today is going to start out on the smart home. But as I'm talking about these issues, there are many locations outside of the smart home that I will mention at the end of my talk. I'm going to be using this infographic, and this is one that my privacy and security Brainiacs team created, and I'm going to reference <clears throat> specific types of IoT devices. So there's a link there so you can download that infographic. You can look at it to jog your memory after the talk and so on, or you can get in touch with me and I'll send you a link to it. Um, we also then created three free flip books, digital online books that my team created to raise awareness of IoT risk for those using the IoT products and they provide additional information um, beyond what I'm going to give you today in a very short period of time. They were written for IoT product consumers and businesses using IoT. So now let's move forward to consider some of the common smart home security and privacy risks. So let's start at the basics. This is number one on the infographic for those of you looking at it. Unauthorized access can occur into home networks through a poorly secured Wi-Fi router. 
you should know that i'm sure all of you do but also it can occur through the iot devices that are attached to that wi-fi network and after getting into a home network cyber crooks and hackers uh snoopy neighbors or those that happen to be in the vicinity malicious iot botnets an unlimited number of entities may access the data in the computers and the iot devices they can go into other networks that connect to the home network such as your employer networks if you're working from home banks if you bank from your wi-fi network online sites and so on and when they do that just think about the fact that they can take that pathway to steal data load malware and spyware make modifications track your activities and whereabouts and do a really wide range of other nasty activities if there is insufficient security there's been a lot of research done along these lines in fact one of one research group did um, a test that i thought was very interesting they set up a smart home using the defaults that came on the wi-fi router and a wide range of iot devices and they wanted to see how many hacking attempts would be made against the smart home network after it went online in the first week after going online more than 12,000 hacking attempts had been made. Many of the attempts were successful, including stealing data and planting botnets and malware. Some Wi-Fi router and network security must-haves are listed here on the screen. Um, I'll quickly go through them. Some of these should seem very familiar to you, but you need to use strong authentication to the Wi-Fi router and the network. Always change the router's default password and service set identifier or the SSID that came on the device. Never use a system that only requires an email address to gain access. There are a lot of these out there. Use multi-factor authentication whenever possible. Use the strongest encryption possible. When you are choosing a router, look at the type of encryption used. Look for no less than WPA2 Advanced Encryption Standard or AES Encryption. Use WPA3 where it's available. WEP and plain old WPA with no number at all. They are not strong. Do not get routers who have those. They're too weak to use. Um, enable automatic software, firmware, and security updates from the manufacturer. Sign up for these when installing your product or go to your manufacturer's website if you forgot to do that or call their customer service number. Use a firewall. Now, most new routers have firewalls built in, but to add more security, it is a good idea to add an additional firewall to the smart home network. And if you're using a good one and you implement it correctly, it will not impact your performance. Also limit the network availability to the IoT devices that are on the Wi-Fi uh, router that's connected to it on the Wi-Fi network. So how do you do this? Well, here's something very simple to do. Turn the Wi-Fi router off at night when you're away from home, when you're offline uh, during extended periods of time. Turn off the network when you're not in use of it. Uh, this this keeps <laughs> hackers from getting in. They can't get into something that's not even up and running. However, if you think oh, we can't do that, well then create a separate Wi-Fi network just for your IoT devices, if at all possible. This keeps the smart home devices separated from your home computers and all the associated data and video and photos stored on them. It also helps to protect your business networks and everything else that you're uh, connecting to from that other part of the, the network, if you have two separate ones. Make sure that the manufacturer has security and privacy instructions and additional information provided for using their products securely, and they should provide customer support. This type of non-technical support is very important, and it's just as important to have that as having the technical capabilities there as well. 
Okay, number two on the infographic, if, for those of you looking at that, <clears throat> covers the smart home hubs and the controllers. Those are what manage the IoT devices in the home or other types of buildings or facilities. Now, they are often comprised of hardware controlled usually by an app on a smartphone. However, weak security on hubs and controllers, of course, can make them discoverable by online crooks, uh, which can lead to unauthorized settings changes, surveillance through attached devices, and also may allow for malicious and illegal code to be planted on the smart home network. Many hubs and controllers have poor security. That's just a fact. Uh, for example, a research company recently performed tests that showed how easily it was for a popular IoT security system controller, how easy it was for hackers from online to simply get access into it using the email address again. What is it with having only email addresses required to get access to so many different devices? It's just crazy. Well, this then allowed, of course, all the associated IoT devices to be accessed and controlled by the hackers. Uh, this has happened multiple times. So you need to make sure that you implement, of course, the same security must-haves that I described for the Wi-Fi routers and networks, but also think about this too. Don't use your public Wi-Fi, like from airports and restaurants, uh, cafes, to access your smart home network. Instead, connect through your phone telecommunications service or some other secured connection. A lot of, of um, hacking, a lot of unauthorized access gets in through those types of public networks. Don't use a hub or controller that uses Telnet. There's a lot that do. Look in the device documentation to see if this is used. Telnet has had known security flaws for years. Instead of using products uh, with Telnet, use those that have more secure protocols such, such as SSH. See if that's in the device documentation. That device documentation had better give you a lot of details about the security and the components of the IoT product. If it doesn't, I would avoid even getting the IoT product because that's a, a red flag right there. Use a hub and a controller that store the data locally, not in a cloud. And I know some of you are thinking, hmm, how likely is that? Well, there's a lot out there that do offer this. When uh, you're able to do that, that's good. Cloud services are complex. They typically have a huge number of entities accessing them, supporting them, um, sharing data with them, taking data from them, processes and devices. You know, there's a lot of already existing privacy and security risks, and I know they can be secured if uh, done appropriately, but when you add the IoT devices within them, that creates new types of risks that then need to be addressed as well. Also, keep your controllers and display screens secured from unauthorized viewing. Require strong authentication to change the settings through that controller. If the screen cannot be hidden and secured through a screensaver type of capability, then keep that controller physically secured. So now let's go on to um, number three on the infographic, access to smart home devices, controllers, hubs, and other components. They're often made through connections with computing devices, right? That allow the smart home dwellers to gain access to useful reports, to settings, to dashboards, and other types of information about the smart home activities and devices. These connections from computing devices create pathways to IoT devices, to data, and other connected networks. Again, if you're using a network that is attached to your IoT device, um, that is also connecting to other networks, your business, if you're working from home or working remotely, financial sites, when you're doing online banking, schools for remote learning, and so on, those create pathways if they are not secured appropriately. Poorly secured connections can allow for many security incidents and privacy invasions. So here's just one 
of thousands of examples. Researchers uh, did a test of 20 uh, apps for some of the most popular smart devices, and they found that smart uh, or that cyber intruders were able to intercept data, modify data, change smart home device settings because of poor security on the apps and on the computing devices that were using them. So security must-haves are shown here. Of course, use your anti-malware, use your firewalls. Uh, sometimes you need to use more, as I mentioned earlier. Those provide additional security. Use VPNs for your uh, computing devices wherever possible. Hopefully, I think probably most of you know those create encrypted transmissions that others who may be on a public network would not be able to easily access. Use strong authentication to your computing devices, multi-factor authentication and or um, authenticators like biometrics. Those are things that can help to block attacks. Strongly encrypt the data stored in the device and transmitted to and from the device. Now, let's get on to the actual IoT devices now, which I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, when are you gonna get to those? I wanted to talk about those basic components because those impact the IoT devices. But now we're to the IoT devices. Um, those are many different uh, numbers on that infographic. Let's take a look at them. We want to make sure if you're using an IoT device, you want to have them as beneficial as possible, right? Working as you want them to. You need to make sure that they're secured. So I'm going to focus on some practical security actions that you can take for the many security and privacy incidents that have occurred and will continue to occur when appropriate security is not um, established. The connections that IoT devices make to smart home networks can and have created pathways many times over the years for cyber crook spies and snoops to get into your network and everything attached to them. So here's just a couple and I, ha I have literally hundreds of pages of examples, but here's just a couple out of thousands of real life examples. So here's one you've probably, many of you have probably heard of. So in 2017, there was an IOT smart uh, aquarium, a smart aquarium, had a smart thermostat actually in a Las Vegas casino, and it was hacked through that smart thermostat because that smart aquarium with the smart thermostat was also connected to the casino network. Now the cyber criminals used that smart thermostat because they saw it when they were online. They were able to get into it. They saw it was connected to ca the casino network. And from the casino network, they were able to get into the casino's computer systems and databases that were attached to the network. They were able to exfiltrate 10 gigabytes of confidential data about the big money gamblers that went to the casino and they exfiltrated all that data to Finland. Okay, so that was from just an innocent looking smart uh, aquarium. Well, now let's talk about innocent looking smart toilets. Those have been around since at least 2011 and 2013. The MySatis toilet was hacked and the hackers remotely controlled the flushing, the bidet, the hot air blower, and all the capabilities. Ultimately, get this, because the app, which was one of the basic things that I started out with, that app controlling it used a hard-coded pin. What was that hard-coded pin? Zero, 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 zero. Horrible, horrible security. So some of you are probably thinking, yeah, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that is connected to other networks, like I told in the background information, right? Now let's fast forward to 2021. The harms that can occur through unsecured smart toilets today are much worse. Why are they much worse? Well, guess what? Smart toilets are now being prescribed by doctors as a type of medical device for patient care in their homes. And it's connecting and getting all sorts of data for cancer patients, for diabetes patients, and for other types of health problems. So those smart toilets now can do so much um, types of information. It can analyze the deposits within the toilet bowl in addition to 
taking photos and videos and audio, and it's often sending all of this via wireless communications stored in clouds and accessible by apps. Access to that information and changes to that health data. Think about what that could do. It could cause incorrect prescriptions. It could cause incorrect healthcare prognoses and other harms, including, of course, what probably a lot of you were thinking about, embarrassment. Why am I talking about smart toilets and smart aquariums? I want to drive home this point, the point that there are millions of smart devices being used that people would never, ever even think about as needing to be secured or even as being security or privacy risks. Smart toothbrushes, smart bras, smart shoes, any other type of smart things. Those are the devices that will be used to cause security incidents and privacy breaches because those are the devices that often do not have sufficient or even often no security built into them. They seem just too mundane or non technical to need security. Any type of IoT device needs to be secured based upon the goal and use of the device and the context within which it's used. Consider this, there were twice as many IoT hacking incidents in the first half of 2021 than occurred in the first half of 2020, and they are going to increase. Why are they going to increase? Because cyber criminals are opportunists and there's more and more IoT devices being used all the time. Hackers are going to enter and steal valuable data and do many other malicious activities to any, any unprotected network they find, including your smart home network or your employee's smart home network. Every device discoverable on the internet is a possible target. It does not matter if it is a smart home network or if it is the network of a large casino. If it can be found, it can be used by hackers and others for malicious purposes. So a few security must has never, ever, ever use the default passwords that came on the devices. Change that default password. It should be the first thing done before uh, you start using it, right after you take it out of the box and get it booted up. Disable the IoT product capabilities you do not need and those you never use. Check the capability settings occasionally to make sure auto updates did not re-enable the disabled capabilities. Why should you do this? Because you can tell when you find a device online, the types of activity going in and out. And if the hackers, the malicious actors see a certain type of device and they notice that there's some capabilities that are never used, they're going to say, aha, I can probably use that capability myself to do whatever I want to try and get into that uh, device and then into the networks that attach to it. Establish strong security settings, turn on encryption, use multi-factor authentication, you know, enable product updates, change the default settings, Plug the, the devices when not needed. I mean, that is so simple to do. I have um, an Alexa uh, Echo Show down in my kitchen. I, I plug it in only when I want to use it. When I'm down there, I keep it unplugged. If it's unplugged, that eliminates that as a risk. Take training provided by the manufacturer for how to securely use the device. If the manufacturer does not offer such training, then request it. They need to provide that so people know how to securely use their devices. Hold the IoT product manufacturers to their privacy and security promises. Read their website privacy notices within their product packaging too. They should have that there. Ask how they enforce their promises. Also, smart uh, home security cameras, door locks, and garage controls, they can be very handy. They provide safety. However, if security is not strong, of course, those smart doors and garages can be open. And many cases have occurred where they were 
leading to home intruders, security cameras. Those can be hijacked by intruders talking to people inside, which has happened many, many times. They can be turned off, uh, leaving the occupants with a false sense of security and vulnerable to intruders. Views of the inside and the outside of the home where the cameras are pointing might be live streamed to online sites where those with malicious intent may be watching, resulting in robbery, property damage, assaults, and, and so on. And even now, under some laws, neighbors have sued successfully their neighbors for having a security camera that goes into their backyard. Uh, this has occurred over in Europe under GDPR. Uh, many incidents have occurred when smart cameras and entryways are just simply not secured. I mean, again, we could have thousands of examples, but as one, a, a couple witnessed a hacker digitally coming into their home through their Google Nest device, the, the hacker started yelling obscenities at them, which, you know, uh, they could have turned it off, but before they turned it off so they didn't have to hear that, uh, the hacker had actually raised the, the setting on the thermostat up to over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The security must-haves for security cameras and locks are similar to what we discussed previously for other IoT devices. I want to point to disabling the capabilities again. I already indicated that when those capabilities are enabled but you're not using them, it does attract cyber intruders to use those capabilities because they know that you probably wouldn't notice if that happened. The smart vehicles, those are so cool. And, you know, they are. There's a lot of capabilities that could provide some really beneficial things, but there are also cybersecurity worries to think about along with safety concerns. So I want to provide you with a personal example. In 2016, I was driving a new Wi-Fi enabled smart car 1500 miles from des moines to the east coast to take one of my sons to a university visit um, and while he was driving i was doing some research uh there and back and i was using the same types of free online tools that hackers and everyone else in the world can use and i found hundreds hundreds of other cars driving around me on the interstate and in, in parking lots and in buildings close to where I was driving that had open access points to their own Wi-Fi enabled cars and semis, uh, to their laptops and their smartphones inside and IoT devices such as their fitness trackers. I could see without even getting into the files, the types of systems they used the security that was and was not implemented, such as no encryption or the type of encryption if it was, in, was used, and many other insights that cyber intruders could have used to actually infiltrate not only the car system, but every smartphone and laptop and IoT device within the car and vicinity. Researchers have already shown how they can remotely apply the brakes of smart cars, take over steering wheels, and even change artificial intelligence within smart cars to do things that are the opposite of what they were supposed to do, like running into people instead of avoiding people. When you're considering purchasing and leasing and renting or writing in uh, your smart vehicles, make sure that security and privacy controls are being used. At a minimum, smart vehicles need to have the listed protections, strong encryption on all transmissions and communications between the vehicle and an outside support device, service or network. Uh, look at the driver's manuals for this or ask the vehicle agent about this. They should know about that. If they don't know about that, then there's something missing in the training and the awareness there, or there's something missing in the technical capabilities to begin with. Ensure strong vehicle authentication standards are used ensure intrusion detection systems are built into the vehicle a smart vehicle should have those built in ensure that software vulnerability and malware detection are also built in ask the manufacturer to verify those malware protections ensure that security and privacy training and detailed instructions are provided to the consumers purchasing them Manufacturers should provide extensive training for secure use, privacy protections, and provide information about the built-in 
security capabilities available to those using their vehicles. Automating and making home utilities such as electric meters and water meters and gas meters as smart as possible. That's a trend that started as far back as 2008. However, there are cybersecurity and privacy risks associated with using smart utilities meters and that those that uh, are using them really need to know about. So here's just a few examples. Physical attacks can occur that were informed by the data coming from the meters. I led, uh, as Kim mentioned in my intro, I led the Nest Smart Grid Privacy Group uh, for several years, starting in 2009. Read Nister 7628 Volume 2 and also 7628 Volume 2 Rev 1. They're different, but they both have still applicable details and information about how to do that. Cyber attacks and unauthorized access may be made through the meters to devices attached to the smart home network. For example, a hacker that can enter the smart home network through an inadequately secured smart meter could launch attacks to completely cut off the electricity or the water or the gas to the home to steal data from the network storage locations and so on. And then something to consider is that data from the meters can be used in court cases and they have been used in court cases. They can also and have been used for business decisions such as determining casualty insurance premiums or determining how much money you should get on an insurance claim. So security must haves are making sure you have account management capabilities uh, that exist, allowing the owner or the user to use account identifiers for different individuals to use um, within the home or the landlord who, or whomever is controlling that, but each with specific access capabilities and abilities to restrict access to the meter, to the controls, to monitor usage, uh, to see if there's been successful login attempts and so on. You need to have strong authentication. Some utilities companies have, they're still doing this. They still have used only account numbers to access the smart meter accounts and the, the control panels. In such instances, there have been instances where the account numbers were used to get to the meter data, change it, get into the home uh, owner's Wi-Fi network and the attached devices and do a really wide range of criminal activities. Use encryption for the stored and transmitted data. That should also be available. And you'll hear me say, saying that a lot. I'm a strong believer in strong encryption. It should be used. Um, it's one of the best ways you can protect your data. Beyond the smart home IoT security and privacy risks, you must also consider all those connections to the smart home that can use their own networks and IoT devices. These are covered within volumes five and six of our free IoT flipbooks on our privacy and security Brainiac site. So quickly, let's go through and look at some of those. Others in the vicinity, this applies to number 11 on the infographic. So neighbors, devices, drones, mobile surveillance, and so on. There have been many situations where neighbors have used their security cameras to record what the neighbors are doing. In many, many instances of people actually using drones to spy on others have occurred. Uh, and it's still occurring. And simply using tools like I described earlier to spot open access into the neighbor's Wi-Fi networks and IoT devices have happened many, many times. Uh, plus now with the Amazon sidewalk changes, those possibilities are even more likely. We also have um, several different icons in the infographic that apply to smart buildings. This is where the risks can dramatically get really, really complex. Personal IoT devices often interact with other IoT devices, each recording sounds, collecting data from in the vicinity, also images, data from the networks, the photos, videos, other files. Each of these on their own has thousands of IoT devices used or planned to be used. For example, it's projected that, uh, let's, let's go to healthcare. 
healthcare providers in hospitals and clinics and those providing telehealth, it's projected they're going to widely be using electronic smart skin patches through the next 10 years when just these types of smart devices alone, the smart skin patches, will have projected sales of, only, of over 30 billion US dollars. Now these skin patch products, they will be for diabetes management, cardiovascular monitoring, cancer treatments, and an unlimited number of other types of uses all very beneficial. I'm all for very beneficial IoT devices, but they need to be secured. So bad things can't be done using them. So think about it. These patches are going to be interacting as part of the smart home and connecting to the hospital system and networks, treatment centers, making the security of the entire huge IoT ecosystem important to ensuring safe and accurate treatments. Similar expansion of use will be in farm and agricultural facilities, factories, schools, office buildings, apartment buildings, and on and on and on. Number 15 in the infographic represents smart interstates. Those of you who are uh, attending today from the Des Moines area, this is my my, the icon my team made is a little homage to I Interstate 80 that's running through Des Moines, uh, but there's also a lot of smart poles that are going up beside them. There are just so many uh, thousands of real life examples I could give you about smart interstates, smart subway tunnels, trains, rails, and so on. You know, I was born and raised and lived all my life up until just a few years ago on farms. And I actively farmed when I was not working at my technology jobs. And I actually went war driving through the countryside when I was um, out on the farm. And I would do that during harvest times, doing research for my tech work. War driving, for those of you who may not be familiar with that, it basically means using tools and all mine were freely available to search for nearby open and unsecured Wi-Fi access points while driving the car. Actually, I would set up my laptop and put it in the seat beside me and it did all the work collecting things on its own. But um, I would use that to determine the extent of the unsecured networks I would go by. So basically, while I would drive by through the countryside during harvest times, I was able to find the GPS and the harvest controllers unsecured in the tractors where they had been implemented, in the combines where they had been implemented and other types of field equipment. This is as far back as 2001. A lot of people mistakenly don't think that farming is high tech. I can tell you that farmers have been doing much more high tech things uh, for, in many cases, longer than other types of industries because uh, the gadgets really helped uh, with their farming and could be implemented within a lot of those different types of vehicles and farm implements. A malicious person, if I had been a malicious person, if I had been a mean neighbor <laughs> who didn't want my, my neighbors uh, being uh, being a harvest to be as good as what it could be, could have altered the settings and completely destroyed the, the farmer's harvest. I did security and privacy research and analysis for a smart highway and parts manufacturing business in 2015 to 2016. I found multiple cybersecurity vulnerabilities in just the smart light poles portion of the package that they wanted to sell, such as the ability for skimmers to be unnoticeably inserted into the USB charging ports that they had put into each of the smart poles that were going to be located by the interstate highways every half mile or so. So charging ports, of course, everybody wants a charging port nearby, right? That sounds great. And on the surface, it is great. Everyone loves to have an abundance of charging ports, but what happens when you have unnoticed skimmers 
that can be put into those charging ports. And let me tell you, if you have a skimmer in one of those charging ports, it's you, the average person can't even tell it. And even a tech person often can't tell it's in there unless they actually get in there and know what they're actually looking for. It would allow the devices charging using those ports to be infected with malware, have data stolen from the devices and other malicious actions, and then to spread malware to the IoT devices in the smart homes when the infected charged devices subsequently were connected there. So there's a lot of cool things going on with smart roads and travel. You gotta watch out, watch out for hackers too. Um, Number 16 in the infographic really emphasizes the ease of hacking from anywhere in the world into the IoT devices. Many tools, most of which are free, such as Shodan. And I think probably a lot of you have heard of Shodan. And you know that they can allow for intrusions by the information they give into open IoT devices anywhere in the world. I've shown clients how easy it is to use Shodan and the tools similar to it to pinpoint the locations of open IoT devices and then determine using free tools, the systems, those with no encryption, no authentication, weak passwords and other uh, vulnerabilities. It makes it very important for every person using an IoT device to make sure that they have implemented security to protect their smart home network and their privacy. Number 19 in the graphic. Uh, if you've been in information security any amount of time at all, you know that disposal of tech is a long time problem. Disposing of or selling devices, IoT devices and products without first removing all the data, files and software from them. If you stop using an IoT device, completely remove all the data and the apps and the software from the device, from the cloud, from the controllers in the hub, make sure that you get rid of all that, even if you're throwing it in the garbage, especially if you throw it in the garbage. The crooks love finding those devices in the dumpsters or in the trash cans, even going out to the city and county garbage dumps. Make sure that you have secure disposal. Number 20 in the infographic, call centers, customer support, uh, maintenance and other third parties. This is a huge concern. I was an expert witness in a case where lack of identity verification for the IoT device controller and app access resulted in a woman being assaulted by the stalker that she was hiding from in a hotel. She saw, get this, she saw that there was activity in her smart car dashboard and logs. She suspected before the assault, way before the assault occurred, that the stalker was getting into her smart car account, even though she had asked the call center upon three separate occasions. She asked them to not allow anyone other than herself access to her smart car information. She even asked them to disable having that information available to anyone. However, they did allow access. I was able to confirm, and I can talk about this because this is not a unique situation. This has happened many other times too, unfortunately, but I was able to confirm through the car and other IOT logs and the controller and the hub logs, along with the, uh, the customer support phone call recordings that they did give even after the car owner, I heard her on the phone begging them to, during a phone call to disable her account because she said it, she said she feared for her life and they still went ahead and gave the stalker access after he used successfully social engineering multiple times to trick them. Not only did they have very weak identity verification procedures and did not log all the requests upon, along with many other problems such as, here is a big problem too. The car company that had engaged them to be the call center, the car company did not give them requirements 
for these types of situations to verify identity, procedures to stop social engineering attacks. So make sure that any call centers you use have those in place. And if you use a call center, make sure that they are following the right procedures. So I want to quickly go through uh, these seven categories. Well, I don't need to go through them, but basically I'm summarizing here the types of IoT tech risks that I just went through in fairly uh, wide detail. Also boiling down all of those different must have security actions for smart homes include these, I don't know, I'll, I'll call them the top 10 must haves. Of course you need to do other things too, but most times you need to do these top 10 things. And you can get more details again at our uh, Privacy and Security Brainiacs. If you want to, again, look at the infographic, I'm providing this again because I figured uh, if I showed this to you at the beginning, you might not realize how often I was going to reference it. So here it is again, if you want to download it and see some of the risks that I do include described out on our site. Also, I have a lot of non-tech industry friends, family members, and folks who listen to my radio show and they subscribe to my monthly tips messages. And they've been asking me questions about security and privacy for a few decades now. And they have often told me, they say, you know, we really appreciate how I uh, explain the issues to them in ways that they can understand. So earlier this year, my privacy and security brainiacs business we started publishing a series of books called the Cybersecurity for grandparents and everyone else series and the q4 uh, edition of this book is about iot security and privacy and it's going to contain not just the information i covered today but also have a whole lot more examples and details and tips and a glossary so those who aren't from the tech background can understand these terms. And then also several pages to take notes, which people like to take notes so they know what to look for when they go in and are looking for these types of um, items or giving them as gifts. If you're interested in knowing more about IoT product security, privacy, and related information, here are some resources for you to consider. Uh, there's a lot out there. Um, also, yeah. As Kim mentioned, I've been working uh, as part of the IoT cybersecurity team. I have their link on here too. That's uh, kind of from a different perspective, looking at you know the manufacturers, uh, what they need to do to build security and privacy into the devices, and also what to do for consumers. And what I've been talking about today is what you as a consumer, even in a business setting, need to do to to be proactive and secure those devices. Uh, so just remember, when it comes to smart devices, if a device is ever on a network, including your home Wi-Fi network, that becomes a potential pathway to all the data, all the devices, and all the other networks that that network attaches to. It becomes a potential pathway within the full IoT product ecosystem, even an innocent looking fish tank or toilet that is smart uh, needs to be secured to keep the cyber intruders from stealing data, from snooping on you, using it as a pathway and so on to other things. So it looks like I did leave us about eight minutes here, five to eight minutes. Here's my contact information, along with a few of my books, uh, the radio show, and I also wanted to include my chief security officer, Jesse the Doberman, who's patiently waiting for me downstairs <laughs> after I get finished today. I'm happy to take questions in the time that we have available. I'm looking over here in the chat. And I don't know, Kim, if you want me to, to look at that or do you have specific questions that you'd like for me to, to address at this time? Um. I can, I have a few. Okay. So I'll go ahead. It says, Derek said, I'm always concerned for two factors, getting hacked via the device. Um, and number two, unintended sharing of data collected images info. How can these be eliminated? Well, it looks like he asked that around a quarter after 
uh, the hour oh, okay. we started. So I'm hoping, Derek, that a lot of the questions that I, or a lot of the information that I provided would help with that. But I do want to, again, uh, emphasize about how it is yes, that around. Um, yeah. very effective to have a separate Wi-Fi network set up for your IoT devices versus everything else that you have on your home network. That would be very effective in addition to just unplugging those devices when you don't need them. I mean, that's such a, a low tech action to take, but it's also one of the most effective actions you can take as well. Um, Samuel said, disable the smart car. Doesn't the system have a fuse in a box under the hood somewhere? Check the own, owner's manual. Well, there's um, millions of different IoT products out there. And that's kind of why I started with describing the basics that are behind the IoT products. So it really depends upon the type of IoT device or the product that you're using. Some IoT devices, the actual device itself, might have all of this complexity built within it, whereas others like the smart skin patches, um, they might not have much there at all. And they're depending upon these back office types of systems, a, a cloud system and an app, your computer, your Wi-Fi network. So it really depends upon the device that you're talking about. Um, and that's why it's important to know all of these components and really know the risk of each of them. And that's why I did include those other things because there's not a, a one size fits all when it comes to security for the IOT devices. So I have a quick question. We have a few minutes and I always think about this and you know, these ring doorbells are so uh, popular right now. Yes. So what would, what would you, what's your take on that? Cause I'm very, I don't have one. I think they look awesome, but I don't feel safe having one. So what's your take on that? Yeah. So with the, with the ring or the, you know, the nest, the things that are very, um, popular you need to really look at who all has access to that data first of all what's being given to others by default that's one thing that worries me the fact that there are so many third parties and um, so many defaults that never get changed once they're implemented i think if you follow a lot of what i gave as tips that would help to secure them but even then um my compilation of um, hacks and oftentimes it wasn't I hate to call things hacks when it was just somebody finding an open device online and it didn't even have security in there to begin with make sure with those popular devices like that that are run by apps on your your phone make sure that you have them set appropriately and here this is very important that a lot of people don't think of and i didn't mention it earlier but i'm that's a great question kim because when you have a lot of apps on your phone there make sure that those apps that you have on your phone are trustworthy because here's what i found a lot of people download apps to their phone and then they either forget they did that or they use it once and say, oh, I don't like it, but they never uninstalled those other apps. If you have apps you've installed and you haven't uninstalled them, oftentimes, especially if they were built to collect data from your phone, you don't want them. A lot of times when people downloaded them, they had to agree to let the, the app make changes on their phone and so on or get access to their other apps. Make sure you delete all other apps off of the phone that you're using for your Nest or your Ring um, controlling uh, device because you don't wanna have all of that access or capability existing in other apps on that phone. I didn't mention that again, but that's an important thing to do. Hopefully I described that succinctly enough, but uh, yeah, get rid of your, access apps you never use okay well that is great we are down to a few minutes rebecca um how what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they have any questions in the sure. future yes go out to privacy security uh we have um an 
an email address that my full team gets copies of. It's info at privacysecuritybrainings.com. Again, please check out those flip books because we did make them for people who use the IoT devices so they know what they can do from a technical and non-technical standpoint. And then, as I mentioned toward the end, uh, we will have the next paperback book coming out on Amazon soon. And that will have a lot more uh, examples and a lot more places to take notes in there to help you to actually um, know how to use your own specific IoT devices better. Okay. Well, thank you again. Rebecca has uh, been our keynote speaker in the past. It's always a pleasure to have her. So thanks so much, Rebecca, for being here today and have a happy holidays and stay safe and secure and keep up all your hard work. Thanks thank so you much, so much, Rebecca. Kim.